this uh, is this a social call? I didn't understand what you did you say? Is this a social call? Yes, yes it is. What is it that you need from me? I do not know you. I'm Max. I uh, read a book about you, but I'm not sure who you are. So I, I would. Uh, are you Nikolai or George? This is George. Hey, welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, yeah, I I read uh, Jim Watson actually uh, wrote uh, nice things about you. So that's how I recognize you. And then um, what nice things did they write? Uh, uh, J- Basically, how you uh, were instrumental to understand to understanding the genomic code. Ah, the genetic code, great uh-huh. mystery for the human being. Right, still not fully understood, and will not be for a while, because you do not know of all the energies that are involved in it. You right. are only aware of some of the energies that are there, and that is why it's such a mystery. DNA right. has more energies than what you know, and the brain is um, uh, the brain is a creator of some energies that you do not even realize. Also, there is some quantum elements to the brain that uh, keep it moving in uh, the fashion that it moves has quantum uh, advantages. Right. Uh Uh-huh. Very good point. So we are thinking about it, trying to figure out the genome has been uh, read about for uh, 19 years now. And we still need to understand what's written there. Which part of it are you still struggling with? Uh, The repetitive part. The repetitive part comes from the amygdala. Do you not know that already? That doesn't make any sense to me. Ah. The the amygdala does... mm, Let me explain. When information comes to brain, uh, it goes to all the parts it needs to go to, plus the amygdala is uh, a checkpoint and sends back a response that the information received was correct. So therefore, the uh, amygdala checks all information. How does it relate to the genome? I mean, the genome is everywhere, not only in amygdala. It's, uh, oh, yes, that's true. Absolutely. It's, it, it's present I just even, it pointing out something, that's all. It, it's present even in those uh, animals and plants yes, where yes. there's no amygdala. Oh, yes, yes. I mean, there are repetitive the, uh, elements in, uh, in plants, so, yes, and yes. lots of them. I was just saying how it works in humans. So in humans, there is amygdala which somehow interacts with repetitive elements? Yes. Gosh. Of course. I mean, yeah, I I understand. I mean, the brain should be able to use a lot of repetitive elements for its work. It does. It's It's very, very repetitive, yes. And that that is why it's a computer. It's... It... It... Checks and rechecks information. I just wonder and how much. Ma- in, in in plants, there is similar work done, but not by the by any brain that is there, but by the the way that it is put together. It can bounce information around, and it is very basic, though. The human brain is much more complex, of course, but in a plant, it still bounces around the information because in everything that is alive, there has to be a check to make sure that all things are working properly. And once you, they realize that there is 
duplicate actions happening, triplicate actions even sometimes happening all at once, simultaneously. It is like, um, mm, it is like time. Time is simultaneous as well, but in these plants and organisms and other animals, they reflect all the, the different information more than once throughout the system. It does not take long. Right. Um, we, we, we came to the understanding that um, mushroom network, which is called mycorrhizal network underground, is yes. one of the most ancient um, and most likely very wise uh, entity living on Earth. Yes. And I wonder, I, I, I didn't look yet at the genome, genomics of mushrooms, but I'm suspecting that somebody already sequenced them. So it would be nice to look at the genome and see how if their genome is of, uh, uh, relates to ours in any way. Mm. That is a difficult question. Yours is so much more complex. There is, in, is and yours is deliberate. Um, um, the way your genomes work uh, are deliberate, whereas the mushroom is instinctive. But the thing is, you may think that genome is extinct uh, as, uh, what is the word? Mm. Is not so, um, it's hard because I do not speak English and he does not understand Russian. So, um, but in plants, in plants, in mushrooms, genome is ex uh, instinctive, instinctive. Mm -hmm. In humans, it's not so much. It is, but it isn't. It's about the collapse of the wave function. Yes. Understood, yes. It's much more than that. Is it? Yes. At least that's where our, our understanding is now, that we are collapsing the wave function, and that's the way we think. Ah. <laughs> yes. Well... Oh, boy. The brain is hard to speak about when you, you can use the proper terms. Um, I would like to speak about that wave collapse, but that is how you think you think. And that is okay, but it is, there's more to it than that. Oh. Now, the functions that happened with that collapse are multi multifunctional as it collapses there's more things happening oh. uh, we started to discuss in the epigenetics again i don't know when you le left i think epigenetics wasn't even uh discussed at all no but basically uh, we have four letters, as you know, A, G, C, T. Yes. A pairs with T and G pairs with C. Yes. So uh, now we know for sure that C um, uh, can be methylated. So the sequence stays the same, but on the top of the sequence, there is a chemical methyl groups attached to C. And surprisingly, the pair CG, when it, has, when it is methylated, it looks more like AT. The shape of the molecule is much closer to AT. So the resonances that happen in this pair would, uh, would be much more AT-like and much less of GC-like. So just by simple methylation, which happens, uh, some, some enzymes do that, methylases. They come, they methylate, so basically they change the vibrational properties of the sequence to uh, from one to another, but its coding, its protein coding uh, properties remain the same. So yes. the, the, the enzymes right. would recognize it as uh, C, but the uh, waves would recognize it as, as T. Correct. 
So um, the vibration between them it can um, interchange. They can interact with their their vibrations can interact, and um, that is one of the properties of DNA. It can interact on itself within itself so that it can do the things that it needs to do and it doesn't have to create a new genome or an, a create sequence. A new, it's called sequence. Yeah. Yes, yeah, sequence. So mm -hmm. it that is one of the beautiful functions and genius of the DNA that it can change its vibration and so that it can interact it within itself to create new pathways and new sequences. Right. So you were the one who first pronounced the idea of uh, triplets. You just um, was the first to calculate that you know quadruplets are too big, diplets are too too short. So triplets, three nucleotide stretches are ideal, and uh, they carry enough information to to be useful for protein coding. Yeah. So three nucleotides uh, code for uh, for one amino acid in the protein. That was your idea. And now we just came to that idea again, thinking that maybe in addition to protein coding triplets, there would be vibrational triplets. There are, yes. But I was wrong about the fact that quadruplets and things cannot be useful. The triplets are, are much easier used, yes, and much more uh, versatile. But the quadruplets can be used. But um, the thing is, uh, vibrationally, yes, you are talking about the, how it works vibrationally now. And the, vibrationally, it can interact, as I said before, within itself to change its sequence and pathways. It can also interact chemically to do the same thing. It interacts chemically, and the C and the T can be very similar, even with the chemical reaction. Does that mm -hmm. make sense to you? All right, all right. So, so yeah, we combine now the idea of triplets with the idea of methylation, because yes, yes, uh, there is methylation, and also there is uh, mutations. And uh, yes, I don't think anybody looked at non-coding sequences in terms of uh, the positions of mutations and methylation marks and, and, and triplets and non-coding sequences. So that's a huge field. So the genome has a lot of non-coding sequences. And now when we have a hypothesis that it is triplets that are basically letters in the, uh, in the vibrational sense, then we might look at those and find something interesting there. Of course, yes. That's I, why I wanted to speak to you because you were the first one to think about it. And I think it's still one of the biggest legacies of yours. It's, it is, uh, I didn't get all the way through to where I needed to get with, uh, with that thought process. And it was frustrating to me that um, sometimes the, tripli the triplicate and the triangulation of it did not work the way I thought it would work. And the... The genomes still had a mysterious energy that I could not figure where it was coming from or where it was going. And, but I saw an ac a reaction and I did not know where it came from or what started it or um, several different things. And um, it was unexplainable to me, but I know now that it is energy that we did not discover yet that is doing that. But the thing is, oh, I'm losing my train of thought. Uh, I'm going too far ahead. I need, you need to understand the, the full uh, uh, vibrational and chemical input first, which I think that they are starting to do. And then they can start to understand what, how the energies are created by the vibrations and chemicals. Uh, 
right now we don't have too much of experimental capacity, but we still can analyze the sequence. Which is wonderful, and, yes. And uh, uh, lots of hypotheses can be tested just by looking at the sequence. For example, we could compare... Learn, what, have you, what have they learned recently by the sequences? Uh, uh, that's too much to answer. But there is a, how about I say what, what we have available? We have available lots of genomes, like I think even mushrooms would be sequenced. So we could compare genomes of different uh, uh, level, uh, layers of life or different uh, types of species, beings. And that would give us some ideas. And uh, one of the idea was, uh, like in bacteria, you know that, uh, the, maybe you don't know, but I think you should. Uh, I, th I think it was discovered, no, it was a little later than you left. Anyway, so there are genes that overlap. There is like one gene going in one direction in bacteria, and then there is another gene going in another direction. And they use the same sequence, which is very funny. Um, it's like, um, you know, too, being too greedy on, on sequences. They don't use too much of the length of DNA and they just kind of try to reuse the same sequence. So I wonder if the same principle can be used in, uh, in uh, vibrational genes, vibrational. Oh, yes. yes, they will try to use the same sequences, yes. Because, uh, but they, they can be, they can use the same sequence, uh, but it can do something different because it's, the same sequence is, although it is the same sequence, it is doing something differently energetically or vibrationally. The so, vibrational sequence and the chemical sequences can be the same, but they can do different things. Um, I was talking about reading the sequences from two different strands. Yes. Uh huh. So I was thinking that, you know, uh, Dan Winter was, uh, is very excited and fascinated by two energies coming together and creating a vortex. When two energies meet, they create a vortex. Yes. And I wonder if uh, we are talking about vibration in DNA, if there is uh, two energies in two different strands and they also come together and create a vortex, something like yes, that. Yes, they do. Yes. Yes. You are right. I did not get in. I had not discovered that, though. Right, right, right. But I you were close. You, you were playing with the sequences and the DNA structure, and Jim Watson did the same. So Yes, uh, but you, I did you were not close. discover vortexes. I did not. That was not something that I discovered then, but I know they exist now, um, and they are, they are very uh, necessary. They're, the vortex is necessary to uh, create the energy to continue with the next set of sequences. They, so they do not lose their energies by doing one sequence. To, they can form a vortex to create energy for the next. Uh-huh. Got it. Um, one more idea was that uh, I just didn't pay attention to RNA until now, until I realized that possibly there is even more um, vibrational energy coming from RNA than from DNA. Oh, yes. That was kind of an unusual idea for me, but when the genes are transcribed, and that part you know, genes are transcribed from DNA to RNA, and um, RNA then is spliced, and I think the splicing uh, they discovered after you left. Yes. But basically, the long RNA sequences are spliced out, so there is like lots of loops which are cut out of the um, of the gene, and now they discover that these loops uh, might be still around in the nucleus doing something. And I I, I realized if there are ident lots of identical RNA loops, then they might um, create some interesting um, structures, resonating structures, and just because of the volume of the number of no, the number of copies of these yes. loops, they might create a, a lot of resonance. Correct. The resonation will, will dictate uh, vibrational and chemical sequence. 
Uh-huh. Yes. They are telling mm -hmm. me that I cannot stay. One moment. All right. Yep. Yeah, the time is coming to the end. I am sorry, but I have to go. Uh, we have an, uh, Jim has another four minutes. I wanted to ask you about the uh, Big Bang. Uh, yes. We are still questioning if it was a really Big Bang and how many of them was there. Because, uh, because there was more uh, than one. And it did not create the universe, but just created one universe. Not the, there are many multiverses, but the energy that, that is God, the energy that it is God created uh, the Big Bang, yes. And he set things out in a very interesting way. But after that, he, he uh, controlled it differently. So it's a very interesting theory. Big Bang is part of it because that is how God wanted to, to do it. But there are so many parts of it that I still don't understand. Uh, I, I'm not an expert uh, at all. I didn't look into that. But um, the idea that everything came from one point is uh, only one of possibilities. It is quite possible that there was the universe, the, our world was never in one point. Maybe it was uh, other way around. Maybe it was uh, everywhere, and then it would collapse it to smaller yes. size, but not necessarily to a point. And then it starts expanding again. So it doesn't yes, have exactly. to. Exactly. That is exactly right. You are correct. Because, let me tell you, the big, the bang theory is because I saw that matter uh, implodes upon itself after a certain while. And it, it was not all matter that came together at that point. It could not possibly be that way. All matter existed everywhere, but this was a great uh, massive uh, matter that imploded upon itself and um, was about to create a black hole, but it, there's, there was a reaction within it, a nuclear reaction, if you will, that exploded it. And it was very, very, it was collapsing very, very zillions of tons of mass. It, uh, it was as I see it, but it was not all matter. I just wonder, maybe it's not that interesting to look at uh, extremes. I think the most interesting side part is where things are already structured and... Uh, oh yes, of course. And uh, so maybe well, what I'm saying is, if it is not that interesting to look at the, at the extremes, maybe the extremes didn't exist. Maybe the universe was created already uh, as, as a structure, not as a point. Well, the energy was always, always there. Always, always, always there. So how it got to, into the place that it uh, exploded or created, that we don't know. This was only a theory. And so it is one theory of how one kind of universe could start. There are many, many ways that it could have happened. Yeah, when you look at life, we have uh, a single cell, then which divides and grows. But the cell is already pretty much structured. It's already a universe in itself. Yes. yes. So I, um, you know, lots of people think that the cell might have uh, evolved from something simpler, and I doubt it. I think maybe it was created already from a blueprint. So maybe there was a consciousness that uh, imagined the cell and then drew a blueprint and then synthesized it in our dimension without actually uh, it evolving. So maybe there was a creation of the cell. That is logical. That is logical. I see. So, can 
I can understand your thought process. So the same thing, maybe the universe, maybe it was already designed and materialized as a structure, and then uh, just well, started breathing, and then in, instead of exp uh, then the expansion of the universe could be interpreted as a big bang, but also it can be interpreted as a breathing. It yes, doesn't it have can to collapse. Be. It's expanding because there needs to be more room for God to create. <laughs> right. So, but that is one. The thing is, energy always exists. Was energy um, always um, organized? Was the energy of the universe organized or was it free flowing or how did the beginning start as just pure energy that was uh, because everything is made of pure energy M light matter everything is made of uh, this these basic energies of the universe um last question i had was um were you an alien you're very much unusual Yes. Uh, were you an alien? Were you an extraterrestrial? Of course. I had to come from another place to expand thought processes here on this planet. What kind of species was that? Pleiadian. I see. And what about your drinking? That was fun, but not good. I it see. could be good, but it was not always good. Were you also a reptilian? Uh, I, I knew, knew about the reptilians, but I was not a reptilian. But I acted like one at times. <laughs> I see. All right. Thank you uh, for sharing, and it was nice meeting you in that capacity. Very well. Have a good day. Have a good day and have fun there. Goodbye for now. Goodbye.